I am here with film composer Alexander Desplat. Hello. A, the Oscar-winning composer of The Shape of Water, The Grand Budapest Hotel. This is truly an honor, and I'm so very thankful for you to join me. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for, for having me here Yeah. in Burbank. In Burbank. Nothing but the best here in Burbank. And uh, we're going to go right into it because I know I have you for a little bit of time. We're talking about Isle of Dogs, which is one of my favorite movies of the year. Um, but I want to start with your collaborations with Wes Anderson. Um, this is your, I believe, fourth yes. collaboration. Yes, How yes. did you, who's one of my favorite filmmakers of all time, um, you started on Fantastic Mr. Fox. How did you get involved with Wes Anderson? Uh, through a friend of ours, uh, Stephen Gagan. Mm. Um, I just met him one evening, and uh, I think at, at Stephen's wedding, actually, in New York. And, uh, mm. and Wes mentioned that he had a project, maybe, you know, and he would be in Paris editing if I would be interested. And, and uh, that's where he started. Mm. Um, and, and I knew his work from, you know, from his previous movies, but he had never done animation at the time. Right. Was that a different kind of uh, project for you? Because you knew Wes Anderson from, obviously, live action and his movies. Uh, is there a particular challenge uh, doing a score for animation, say, live action? I know you moved on and did Mo Moonrise Kingdom and Grand Budapest, but it, it, is there something different in the way you compose film? Well, this, especially when, with, the, I think, the, the puppets, you know, with the stop motion, it's very special. It's different from animation, you know, the, uh, processed animation. Right. I think when there's little, these little puppets, you you feel something very um, close to your childhood even more because they're real kind of objects, uh, like the one you had in your in your bedroom as a child. Absolutely. Uh, so so it really throws you back to to that to your to your small bedroom. Um, and the nice thing about it is that you can. Uh, of course, the world of, of sound is completely open because it's not reality. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember in Mr. Fox, at first there was the, this idea of doing a you know classical animation score with a big orchestra, and, and because of this dimension of these little puppets, I thought maybe it's too big. Maybe we should keep this childhood feeling, this mm -hmm. this intimacy, and bring the in, the the. Uh, the, the the orchestra to its to its essence to something very 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 small and actually we just use one instrument of each section of an orchestra like a minimal a minuscule orchestra I and I think it was you know it was and I think it was much more in phase with what was on screen yeah oh god I, I love hearing I'm the scores and soundtracks guy here uh, movie scores I grew up with them I listened to them instead of pop music anything I put on film scores. <laughs> a lot of yours so this is hearing that is uh, making me geek out in a way that I didn't think I would uh, but here I am um, but that makes me think of Isle of Dogs because Isle of Dogs was such a different sounding score for you I know it's very based in Japanese culture I noticed not a lot of like violin I didn't hear strings definitely drums you know what was your how did you get into that did you study kind of Japanese culture? Did you go into it that way? Because it is a very, you're talking about fantastic Mr. Fox. This is completely different in my opinion. Well, if you look at the story, it's, it, it's, it's like a, uh, a young knight trying to, to go into a quest. You know, mm. he's, he's looking for someone uh, for his dog, mm. but, it, but it, it's like a, you know, a medieval tale. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's several ways of doing that. We could have gone to the um, again classical symphonic, uh, emotional, <coughs> very thematic, maybe over sentimental. That I can hear in many um, animation movies, or go the other way and think: Well, the story is very emotional already. It's this boy who has lost his parents, and he's he's he's. he's isolated on a trash island mm -hmm. he needs to go through crazy adventures maybe maybe the audience can feel the emotions without us pushing them mm. um, so now to come back to, to, to the Japanese influence I've always been very near to the Japanese culture for various reasons since I'm a child and um, so I knew that instrumentation I would also avoid any 
shakuhachi or you know shamisen biwa all too many obvious instruments mm. but the taikos were there from the beginning in her conversations with with west because they refer to this archaic medieval mm. heavy uh, heavy weight sound you know this beating um sound that you you hear everywhere in the villages in in, in japan since the older ages so that's the core of the score now how do you bring s an element of your occidental culture into this how do you bring this uh, offside uh, imaginative world that west brings in all of his films mm -hmm. without being just japanese and the idea was that if i bring in instruments we have which have nothing to do with the japanese music it will be very very um, interesting to, to as, a, as an opposition so there's four saxophones mm. four recorders okay. um, and three french horns and a, and a double bass sometimes we double these, these sections but sure and so it's, a, it's even though the drums are very you know uh, organized and doing this very repetitive obsessive march the race is bouncing around mm. almost like a jazzy score mm -hmm. because don't forget there's a spy story in the film in a yes way. it is yeah uh, I, I almost noticed like the use of the drums kind of is in place of a like a recognizable theme mm -hmm. like a musical yes, theme exactly so as you're walk as you're going through the movie it's the drums that I hear it's, it's the, the drum the yes it's the drums taking you by the arm yes and taking you through the story and, and into all the adventures. Yeah, and that's what made it so powerful to me because the, the you know, I, I was introduced to your music late, but Deathly Hallows part one, Harry Potter, started following your career. The differences in the themes you do, the different music that you make, the different themes that I love and have fallen in love with. This one though, just hit me over the head. And um, it was just brilliant. And so I, I, I love hearing that. Um, now, with you, we worked on after Fantastic Fox, uh, Moonrise Kingdom, Grand Bud Budapest. With Isle of Dogs, is does Wes Anderson call you up and say, "Do you want to do this?" And you immediately say yes, or do you have to go? What are you working on? What w do you want to know? The the premise, the concept, as it was. Well, uh, there's a few directors who have been very loyal to me and mm -hmm. who have been also very loyal to. And each time they call me, and there's, there's a huge scheduled conflict, which sometimes happens because some directors go quickly than I do. Mm -hmm. uh, and they suddenly have a project and my schedule is filled up and I just sadly can't do it. But uh, I've tried to be very faithful to, to, to the directors. So Wes calls me, I don't even ask a question. I say, oh, great, what would it be? But um, yeah. Like what would it be? When do we start? That's what I mean. You know? When do we start? I would do the same thing, and that that's amazing. And um, do you does that always happen with your? Um, are there certain projects that other directors maybe that you haven't worked with? I, I think of Guillermo del Toro and your Oscar win for The Shape of Water. Is that another director that calls you and you just say, "When do I start?" Well, um, <laughs> when he first spoke to me about the movie about Ship of Water, it was more, uh, when, do I, when do I read the script? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because when he told me the story, you go, mm-hmm, <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah, I need to get to the bottom of this yes, one. Yes, okay, she's in a bathtub, okay. And, <laughs> and then they have sex, mm-hmm, all right. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you're waiting for the script. Uh, I mean, I've already said yes to whatever project Guillermo is doing. Yeah. You know. And there's, there's a huge scheduled conflict, which I will make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, there's no way I'm not working with Guillermo again. Uh, yeah, especially. Unless he changes his mind. But. Yeah, especially after The Shape of Water. I, you, you were my, I circled you on my Oscar, uh, Oscar ballot. I was thrilled when you won, so congratulations Thank on you. that. Thank you. Um, and it makes me think, too, you started um, you know, very early on with a, a, a director, uh, Jacques, uh, um, I'm looking for Jacques Yeah. Yeah. Yes. On Sisters Brothers, mm -hmm. and um, that was your seventh film, I believe you worked with him. Yes, yes, yes. I scored his first film in in '94. '94. I was I was eight years old. Oh wow! Um, <laughs> and um, we've, yeah, yeah we've, we have we have a long a long relationship, uh, both you know friendship and 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 work relationship. He's a he's the best 
French director alive, I would say, of the new generation of directors uh, for the last 20 years. And his world is, is very uh, special and very different. Mm -hmm. He's a great artist. And each time his movies offer me um, a different approach, a different sound. And what I learned, I think, by working with uh, Jacques and, and I think built also my my personality as a composer is to always be trying not to um, photocopy what is on screen, mm -hmm. but try and expand it or or um, make it even more profound. You know, get go grab the depth of field, or if his if his camera is 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 narrowing the viewer, the view of the audience, make the music make it bigger. Mm -hmm. Almost trying to to play with with his with his uh, uh, mise en scène in, mm. uh, as an opponent, yeah. dancing with him as a, as an opponent, yeah. um, and I've learned a lot by doing that. You know, he, he, this Sisters Brothers is a western, so yeah. if I was starting, okay, it's a western, so there would be French horns and brass and bum ba dum bum 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 bum, you know, all yeah. these things that we've heard so many times. You know, okay, fair enough. But that's been done by Emma Bernstein, by Bruce Broughton. There's been all the Morico Morricone era. Uh, there's been all the, the, the folkish uh, um, uh, sound, you know, of, of uh, uh, Dead Man, all these, you know, all these great... Um, these Western tropes yes, that are so wonderful to explore. Westerns, yeah. Yes, um, Neil Young score, you know, all these things. But so I, I just needed to find something else. Mm. There again, you're, you're confronting yourself to to exploration, to danger, and with Jacques, it's always, always, always the the mantra. Mm. What can we explore that we we haven't? Yeah, and as, is it your first Western that you? Oh yes. Yeah, and <laughs> so what is it about this? Was it Jacques that got you involved, and not the genre, or is it a little bit of both? It was like I want to do a Western, and of course I'm doing it with you, Jacques. Oh no, it's. it's it's Jack yeah. again. He calls me and I say yes. It would have been a, a movie about the beauty salon. I would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, the 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 western is such an interesting. When you're composing, I mean, you brought up some just kind of tropes in there, and uh, it's such a fascinating thing because I think to your earlier works, you've done the period pieces, you've mm -hmm. done monster movies, mm -hmm. you've done, um, you know stop motion uh, is there something is there a genre out there that you haven't done that you're looking to maybe dip your toes in in the future you know I, i'm not sure it's the genre that, that excites me it's the story yeah. and the relationship between the story and the director that i'm going to work with uh the vision that that the director has his point of view if i feel that it's strong and that the uh the, the story resonates with me you know, then I'm I'm happy to go, mm. and I learn from, you know, from scripts that I receive and stories that I've, I've you know, like the King's Speech. Mm. I've learned a lot from from uh, doing that film, or even Girl with the Bird Earring. Mm. Um, I think each movie makes you grow as a as a film composer because you you try to expand your knowledge in general, your culture in general, but also your musical abilities and and the territories that you try to explore, but it doesn't have to be in the genre, I think. I think you can explore um, in a period piece, like Girl with a Pearl Earring, as much as in Harry Potter fantasy or in, uh, um, I don't know, in uh, Operation Finale or mm -hmm. whatever, you know, or, or stop motion. Right. Is there a difference in, in your take on composing for some of the smaller, more intimate character movies versus, say, a Harry Potter or a Godzilla, big blockbusters, you know? Do you, do you tackle them differently? Maybe sound-wise, yes. Yeah. You know that you, you're, you're, you're trying to, to keep your voice down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why? In, in, you know, Harry Potter or Godzilla, you have to, you have to bark very loud. Mm. Your orchestra has to be a big, a big, big... Uh, sound, um, so you're right. Think about that. But that being said, I still believe that um, what I love about cinema it's the narrative, it's the it's the storyline and the characters, 
And I always try to be as near as I can from the characters. I was talking about dancing with Jacques Audiard as an opponent musically to his mise en scène, which is sometimes very dark and very active, and my music can be very calm and very wide mm -hmm. in, in opposition. And it creates a, some kind of a vibration between the two. Um, well, the, the same way I, I try to, to develop this vibration, and the more I go, the more I want to be inside the film, mm -hmm. inside the picture, you know, mm -hmm. that my, my score is not separate from, from the image, like if I was one more actor on the set, playing with the actors. So I, I, I really try and, and emphasize the psychology of the characters, their, their emotions, uh, and be, I think, so whatever it is, as a genre, mm -hmm. that's my main goal, I think. Because I think you, as an audience, you react to the emotions that the characters send to you. Mm -hmm. Not to the building falling. That's you know. That's right. another. It's it's what the eyes of the actress or the the actor brings into your your um, cortex that is uh, strong. Mm -hmm. Now, do you? It's very interesting to hear you <coughs> talk about the the process of it. I mean, are, you know, there are themes in your work that I notice as a. I'm a, a film lover, sure, but I I love scores so. When a score hits me and I'm putting it on, I buy the album, I'm listening over and over again, I might be an outlier. Is it something that you're conscious of going in to score a movie that I want a recognizable theme, like maybe like Godzilla? I want the audience to know, like, because for me personally, I saw some jaws in Godzilla. I saw the idea of not showing the creature for a while. And I felt like your score really kind of was underneath there, but I noticed it very early on. Um, is that conscious on your uh, on your scoring? Um, well, there again, each movie o opens a different window. Mm -hmm. um, some movies, uh, I start with a very strong theme uh, at the opening, for example, opening credits, and then I keep it very discreet for a while, mm -hmm. and at some point, uh, a section of this motif that we've heard comes back or and some other movies like um, the imitation game or even shape of water the theme is part of the of the strong dna of the film and it, it's recurring and it's uh, haunting you mm -hmm. but but word, but, yeah. but but all, all the movies can't can't let you do that with Jacques Audiard, it doesn't really work because his narrative is different uh, more fragmented and more abstract and if a theme was recurring all the time it would be it wouldn't be in phase it would be Alexandre Desplat uh, showing off mm. oh listen to my wonderful melody right. and that's not that's not what I do I, I work for for cinema otherwise I would only write music for for concert and I'd be a genius you know, yeah. listening to my own piece no that's not right I'm, I play in, in a team uh, it's a collaborative work so I'm 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 honoring the film as much as I can with what I with my ideas yeah I I, I was on your website and I was visiting and I was looking at a lot of your influences uh, Nino Rota there's uh, a thousand of them a thousand uh, uh, Jory, uh, Jory. Uh, yeah Maurice, and Maurice Jarre. Jarre. Mm. I can't speak in your native tongue, so it's I okay. apologize for butchering your language. But there was an interesting thing I noticed that um, you were maybe thinking about going into film composing, and then you saw Star Wars and uh, John Williams, of course. Um, and then I think of that missed opportunity for me as a fan. You were going to score Rogue One at one point. Um, that was scheduling, right? And yes. uh, is that a regret? Is that something you wish you got your hands on? It's always a regret not to be able to go to the end of a project. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, now I've I've learned that some of these huge movies uh, they give you a, a time frame, and in fact, it's it's so you know they they're so uh, they put everything in, every every body and every everyone in danger in the studio. It's got to be a hit. Yeah. You know, they, they they cost a lot of money, and so they take the time they need. Mm -hmm. And I was maybe naive to think that on time I'd be able to score it and then move on to to Luc Besson's movie, uh, which I was wanting to work with for many many years. So um, I just had to to you know to vanish. Yeah, do, That's do okay. You, do you hope in the future you could do another 
Star Wars movie, maybe. Maybe a Marvel movie or a DC. Some of these big blockbusters that are just taking over the, our pop culture. That would be interesting, because I've never done that, yeah. aside from Harry Potter, which is something a bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've never had the, um, the moment so far, mm -hmm. uh, the opportunity, but maybe it will come, because uh, it's maybe my, my, the music I write doesn't um, make people think that I would do that. Mm. And actually, maybe that's what excites me. <laughs> I yeah. can put myself in danger yeah. and, and you know go somewhere uh, big that that I which I did on Godzilla of course and Potter a little bit you know sure. somehow but in another direction which I've never done and maybe it would be a real challenge for me. Well, as a as a fan of yours and knowing your music the way I do, I could see you fitting into a Marvel, a DC, and especially Star Wars, which a fan uh, on YouTube actually took some of your music and cut it into the Rogue One trailer. Oh yes. Yeah, they wanted to know what your sound would be like with Rogue One, and I thought it was Did it epic. Work? It worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was a fan of it very much so. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I want to appreciate. I, I really appreciate you coming in. I know you got to head out um, uh, for Isle of Dogs. Though, um, is this uh, a score you're really proud of? We're heading into awards season. Is that something you think about at all? About you know, you've won now two Oscars. Is this something you're looking at? You're very proud of. Is that a hope, or is it you don't care? You just want to do your thing. Well, it's a great honor. It's a great joy to receive an Oscar. I mean, yeah. it's it's. It's a dream for somebody who works in, in the industry, who, yeah. who's worshipped cinema since I was a child, and and being French and being invited to this, you know, giving receiving these honors after the masters that you you mentioned, like John Williams, but also the French Maurice Jarre, yeah. Delarue, or Michel Legrand, or Gabriel Yared. It was a great joy for me, and receiving this second Oscar was incredible. I, I was, yeah. if you look at my face. <laughs> I did <laughs> that night of the Oscar. I'm, you know, I'm ten years ten years old, and and the Golden Globe just before, and the BAFTA, and it was incredible last year. So uh, you always hope that it happens again. Sure, it's not the last time, but it's not what uh, it's not my motto. What what brings me into composing is the films I'm I'm excited about. If they if they hit the the awards, it's fantastic. I'm happy for the movie. Happy for me. Um, if they don't, it's okay, I've tried to do my best job and I, I could win every year, but I can't. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much for coming in, Alexander Zasplat. I am a thank huge you. fan. I hope everybody enjoyed this little section for the Riley Roundtable. Good luck with Isle of Dogs. Good luck with everything else. Do you have one project that you're working on next that you can tell everybody about? Or? Well, um, I was. I just finished a little opera, a chamber opera uh, in, in, in Europe that's been being performed soon and uh, and I'm um, starting uh, The Secret Life of Pets 2 ah, part 2 yeah all oh, right well, another animation with these great uh, friends uh, at Illumination Chris Renault yeah. and Chris Renault Dundry fantastic uh, team oh well that's great well uh, The Isle of fun. Dogs is out now you can check it out check out his amazing unique score this is what we were here for to talk about again uh, Alexander thank you very much for thank taking you, the time to sit with me thank I you. appreciate it thank you